I thought we'd have a pretty fun session talking about PEP and PrEP with folks that are living it and are providing it. Um, I want this to be interactive. I encourage anybody who has a question or an idea about how we can do it better, anybody that has anything to contribute to this conversation to feel comfortable, we want you to get up and go to the mic so that everybody that's seeing us remotely can uh, hear your question as well. Be loud and proud, introduce yourself, um, and let's make this an opportunity for us to have a conversation about HIV prevention here right now today with what, the tools that we have today. So you guys know me, I'm Jennifer Janelle. Um, I'm an infectious diseases provider at UF and at Columbia County Health Department and at Azalea Health and Interlochen at the Sumter County Health Department. Um, I've already talked and bored you guys to death. So I'm going to pass the mic down to our five panel members and let each of them introduce themselves, tell you a little bit about why they're on the panel, why they think that this is an important conversation to be having. And, um, so hopefully we'll, we'll start a conversation that will continue on even after this hour. So I'll pass the phone to Ann Zaya. Thank you so much, and thank you all for being here. I just said to Dr. Janelle, what an amazing turnout. I'm so impressed. It's just wonderful that we have this level of interest because it's such an important topic. Um, my name is Ann Zaya, and I am the clinical coordinator. I manage um, the Square Three Pass. Student Health Center at Shand. We take care of the medical students, dental students, and all the health sciences students, which includes OTPT and anybody else interested in health sciences, including all the graduate students. That's one side of the house. The other side is that we run the occupational medicine program. Um, so we see all of the UF employees um, for work-related injuries. We hope that's none of you. Um, our best day in occupational medicine is when we don't see anybody because you're all using preventive care and um, not getting injured. We also run the employee health clinic, and we take care of all of the pre-placements, um, medical surveillance, we do everybody's titers, and get everybody up to date on immunizations. And I just want to point out that Diane Webb, who is one of our nurse extraordinaires with the Student Health Center, and I'm gonna count on her talking a little bit later, um, does a tremendous amount of work with our HIV population and our students around this issue, and specifically do, she's an expert in immunization, so please, if there's any questions around that, I would defer to Diane's expertise. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is John Mark Schock. I'm from Tallahassee. I work in the state's HIV program office up in Tallahassee. I work in the HIV AIDS section, and I wear a variety of hats up there. I mainly work as a research coordinator managing a couple of projects uh, for uh, HIV cure research and also behavioral surveillance that the state of Florida contracts with the University of Miami conduct the work. About five years ago, my boss uh, needed someone in our section to start managing the research that was coming uh, out uh, on mainly on PrEP and vaccines as well. I expressed an interest in that. And so I continue to do that as well. And um, in addition to following the research, I uh, got to be one of the lead planners on developing uh, the state's uh, strategic plan for trying to increase implementation and, and capacity expansion for PrEP programming here in the state of Florida. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gordon Wilson. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student here at the University of Florida studying math and statistics. Before I was at UF, I just transferred over the summer, I worked at Equality Florida out of Orlando. And the real reason why I'm on this panel is because I've been out and sexually active as a gay man for seven years, and as of one month ago, I've become a patient with Dr. Janelle, and I am on PrEP. So I have been through the experience of um, applying for PrEP and of going through my insurance, and also, I'm here because I want to be a part of continuing and opening up the dialogue and making it more honest and open among men who have sex with men, both here in Gainesville and in the community at large. Um, my experience with originally getting on PrEP began with, um, I think, being a little bit more exposed to the risk factors, having been, um, or aware of the risk factors, having worked for a, a, an LGBT rights organization. And uh, a former boyfriend of mine had been on PrEP, or was choosing to become on PrEP earlier this year. So knowing that, so I'm currently single, but I am sexually active, so I thought that this was a time period of my life where I was at greater risk, and I chose to seek out Dr. Janelle, originally through the uh, Student Health uh, Center at UF. 
Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Nall. I'm a general internist, a uh, primary care doc here at the University of Florida. I uh, spend a lot of time working with medical students and residents in their training. Um, I have interest in uh, pre exposure prophylaxis, uh, PrEP, and LGBT uh, healthcare. I did my training in Boston at uh, Fenway Community Health, uh, where there's a lot of focus on obviously HIV research as well as uh, LGBT care. Um, so that's kind of where I started my interest and have continued to have uh, an interest uh, clinically in this area. Um, I am currently a prescriber of PrEP for my patients, so I think, if anything, I'll bring kind of a generalist perspective uh, to the discussion today, which I actually think primary care is the place we need to be having the discussion of pre-exposure prophylaxis, and um, folks that are lucky enough to meet uh, a Dr. Janelle, um, but we have a lot of patients that, that aren't, and we need to be having a better discussion amongst generalists and primary care docs um, about how we can uh, make these, uh, this uh, prophylaxis available. Um, so I'm glad to join you. Hello, my name is Martha Buffington and I am the medical case management supervisor in area three and 13 for the Ryan White program. I also supervise the ADAP program in Alashua County, the Project AIDS Care case management in area 313 and supervise our perinatal case management program. I, um, I get a lot of calls to, from different people about resources for PEP and PrEP, so I help direct them to patient assistance programs and other resources to get the drugs that they need. All right, so you've all met our panel. Um, does anybody want to start this conversation with a question or a comment? If you do, got to go to the mic. Nobody's excluded. <laughs> I've, I've been taking care of folks with HIV for a little while, and, and I've taken care of a few. I'm on the uh, NATO work study group for STIs and HIV, and one of the big issues that's been raised in is the number of people who are being exposed and being um, infected outside an area that we can reach them. Uh, specifically through social media hookups. And the big discussion is how do we address that? Um, in what ways can we address that? And I'd like to get you to have your idea on that. Ah, okay, Gordon wants to speak <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, so your question is how can we reach people who are using those kind of applications? Um, well, I can say as someone who is on these applications and has been on these applications in the past, um, to varying degrees. Um, these are, first of all, I don't know if everyone is familiar with things, there are widely used applications on, primarily now on smartphones, that like Grindr and Scruff and Jack, and there's like a whole slew of them that are primarily uh, marketed towards gay men. And they're used for a variety of things. Some people use them just for dating, some people use them for casual sex, um, ever, for everything in between. And I found that actually some of these applications are taking steps to promote PrEP. I mean, they are actively promoting, they'll have like little pop-ups and things about sexual health and they'll connect. And though they are, they're looking, I think, to connect to people, to providers and communities so they can connect with people who are using these applications. And because it's geographically sensitive and it, it can tell where you are, they could then, there is a great possibility and potential, I think, to connect those people to the health resources that are local to them. Um, but I think that there is definitely a lot to still be done, that possibly there's some kind of outreach from a health providers to these types of applications, because, I mean, it's probably good to go right to the source. You know, and th these are applications that are facilitating a men who have sex with men to meet each other, and um, to have that information available through that. But I know it is already happening, um, and I think that, and I mean, I can say for myself, like I even, within the profile that I have written, I say, I'm on PrEP and I want to be a resource, ask me about it. Uh, so, you know, being open and honest ourselves, you know, and as a man who has sex with men is one piece of that. I will say, um, I know at, at, through the Finway Institute, uh, Ken Mayer was doing research with just that question, and I don't know if that's been published as to using um, pop-ups on uh, sites such as Grindr to 
um, to kind of actually study that as an intervention. So there may be some data out there, and I haven't looked back into that to see. I knew they were actively uh, looking looking at it. The other piece I would say, as um, and, and in Florida, since we haven't expanded Medicaid, this doesn't apply to a lot of, of men. But uh, in other states, as we do expand and get people connected with primary care physicians, I think this becomes uh, kind of coming back to the social history and understanding risk. Um, and I think we need to be doing a better job of that in primary care and kind of really assessing that. Um, because if we have more advocates and people on PrEP, then you can really start some momentum in the, in the discussion. I think you brought up a very important point. We're increasingly concerned about trying to reach, for example, uh, men who have sex with men who do not identify as gay, or non-gay identifying in a sense. And we, we believe at the state of Florida that utilizing social media is probably a, currently our best hope for trying to reach that particular population. Uh, they don't respond uh, to the traditional brick and mortar activities at, at you know, gay identified venues. Um, increasingly, especially young MSM, uh, especially black and Hispanic uh, MSM tend to use social media a lot. So our hope is that we can reach these individuals, especially the young ones. Uh, the state of Florida, we looked at trying to do this type of work out of Tallahassee and we ran into a lot of roadblocks. Uh, it, it really had a lot to do with government in the sunshine and being able to control our, 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 our media and our IT system. So what we did in response to that, our, our, our largest uh, funding opportunity right now uh, comes from CDC. Uh, it goes under the, uh, the loosely titled name of High Impact Prevention. But uh, when we turned around to fund uh, providers here in the state of Florida, we included the opportunity to write for uh, doing social media related activities, to have staff actually going into places like Grindr and Adam for Adam and uh, providing HIV prevention information to these individuals uh, or helping them get linked up with testing sites or providers. Well, I just learned something. I didn't know all this was going on behind the scenes, so this is great. Does anybody have any questions or comments about this particular question? Does anybody have anything else they want to discuss? Come on up to the mic. And it's a two mic system today. You'll have the one that's there, and then you'll have to coordinate with the other one that they have. Hi, my name is Anthony Black. I'm currently an intern with the Florida Department of Health at Alachua County. So my question was, how would you address the gaps and disparities in access and affordability for these medications for the underprivileged and non-visible audiences? Does anybody want to address that? You might be the best person to address <laughs> that. <laughs> John Mark's going to be on this hot seat all day. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the six and four million dollar question. Uh, prep's not cheap. You think it costs, what, 12 to 14 hundred dollars a month to shell it out of your pocket? Gordon says it was 2000 when he was just trying to get it. I, I can speak for more about that. Okay. Uh, the state of Florida is not quite as fortunate as some other localities. Uh, there's a lot of support from the city and the private sector, for example, in San Francisco. San Francisco is prescribing a lot of prep. Uh, the state of Washington uh, set aside about a, a year, year and a half ago somewhere between a million and two million dollars to purchase uh, PrEP medications for individuals at risk. Uh, the manufacturer, the only, of course, the only approved treatment at this time is Gilead's drug, Truvada. I think you all talked about that already earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a great patient assistance program. Um, I, I have heard that for providers working with individuals, it's frequently easier to access getting the meds paid for through Gilead than it is sometimes going through private insurance and the pre-authorizations and everything that have to be completed for that. There's also some other assistance programs out there. I think one of the best ones is the PAN Foundation. So that's how we get the meds paid for. But we also uh, need to look at how we can get the minimally required labs paid for as well. And um, 
we're, the state of Florida is just at the beginning of, of looking at you know, how we can leverage other funding streams that we have to try to fill in these gaps as well. I, I wish I had a more complete answer for you. Uh, it will probably require having a, a sliding fee scale for individuals without the ability to pay. Uh, you know, the labs, uh, you do need to run certain labs, but they, they really are relatively low cost. Uh, we're just talking about running a creatinine, maybe a, a CMP. Hepatitis B, of course, STD and STD, and uh, then you need to test regularly for HIV as well, about every three months. I think you hit on all the points I was going to mention. The only other thing I was going to say, one patient I have who has insurance, actually through Gilead, they have um, support for copay. So he actually has the copay paid by Gilead, which was kind of a unique, I think they're trying to um, obviously get the word out there about PrEP, um, and so... Um, that was kind of the first time I'd ever seen a company willing to cover the copay for the, for the cost, so we didn't pay anything for the drug. And also through Gilead, they have increased what the um, financial requirements are. Um, a person can be less than 500% of poverty and still qualify to get the drug through patient assistance. Um, although the application is only good for six months, Gilead will let you continually reapply every six months for the drug. And now they will ship it either to the provider or to the applicant. It's no longer just shipped to the provider, that it can go directly to the person's home. So from my personal experience, um, when I first was prescribed Truvada uh, as PrEP, so that's the medication from Gilead, um, the insurance, the, my, my, I have the student health care insurance, which is through United Healthcare, and they actually automatically covered it. So it was not a fight that I had to, uh, I didn't have to fight with them in order for them to cover it. And the copay was already down to $30 per month. From, and it is originally listed as $2,000 a month in cost. And then I had already applied for Gilead, uh, to Gilead for their copay assistance program, with which they'll cover up to $300 a month in copay for a total of 3,600 over the course of a year, and which is, I think, very generous and uh, fantastic. And that's just for people who have insurance. So I don't pay anything. It is free and it is uh, mailed to me, uh, which is another interesting thing. Actually, none of the pharmacies uh, here would, would um, provide Truvada as PrEP, none of the like brick and mortar pharmacies. And I had to go through, and that was a bit of an ordeal to try to find a pharmacy that would give it, that would, um, give me Truvada, and it ended up being a mail order one. Um, I also know I have uh, uh, peers who have used the patient access network, and um, that's been, I think, a little bit more of a bureaucratic struggle. Um, and actually, I really think that probably for people who, even once people get the prescription for Truvada, it can be a very difficult process to get it covered, because not all insurance companies are willing to cover it. And I know just from research I've done online that there are like communities where people have posted the letters, the petition letters that they've written to their insurance companies and say, they said, this is exactly what we wrote and they, this is what the argument we use to get our insurance company to cover it. Use this, you know, as a resource. And, um, you know, and like my former roommate uh, was, he I think had to go through three different sort of funding resources. One of which uh, he was first used had his own insurance, then he had to get the patient access network, and then he had another thing through the AIDS Healthcare Foundation Pharmacy, which was thankfully local in Orlando. But um, it wasn't, it's not as easy for everyone as it is for me, and I think that the level of bureaucratic challenge is one, of, is a big disincentive for people, and it can be a challenge, uh, a struggle for people who want to be on track. And thank you, Gordon, for bringing that perspective in, because that's what I was going to touch on uh, from the Student Health Center. We do have a challenge. We struggle with the students, of course. It's wonderful now that students can have insurance up to the age of 26 through their parents, and many choose to do that. Um, and for some reasons, that's wonderful. They may get uh, different health care because of that, in terms of um, what their co-pays are, because of the family plan, et cetera. Um, there are other students that choose, like Gordon, to go into the student health plan, which is a very generous plan through United Health um, from the Student Health Center. Uh, the Gator Care. Um, however, we do have this challenge with students on these different plans, and we try to work with them 
Um, and not everybody has the same success. Um, and those are the students that we do really try to advocate for and go through these programs. But it is more of a struggle, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Everybody should have ease of access, such as you described. One way to try to relieve that barrier, therefore, would be to utilize what we call peer navigators. I'd be surprised if you all haven't heard of navigators. Uh, HIV navigator. programming has yeah. started using peer navigators now for several years. Uh, again, we're funding solutions like that through our current, current funding announcement. But we're also seeing models from around the country utilizing uh, peer navigators uh, for PrEP itself. So we can envision someone like yourself working with newly diagnosed individuals uh, or who are wanting to access PrEP to help them navigate the challenges associated with that. So I think a couple of good points got brought up. I wanted to make sure you guys all know what we're talking about when we're talking about PAN. PAN is the Patient Access Network Foundation that will provide financial support for a variety of medications for chronic disease. Not just HIV, but they do provide assistance for people that meet certain financial guidelines. Um, and it's not just for PrEP. I have lots of people could go through ADAP Premium Plus, but they don't want to have to do that re-enrollment every six months. And so they have some form of insurance. The co-pays are high. They choose to go to the Patient Access Network Foundation to meet those co-pays rather than have to re-enroll every six months in ADAP and have to use CVS Pharmacy and all the kind of things that come with ADAP. So there are a variety of ways to make things work. Um, so it's Patient Access Network Foundation. They do help with co-pays for hepatitis C treatment. Um, a variety of other chronic diseases. So um, if you have patients that have these kind of needs, you might want to look at, at their website. It does list all the medications that they help with, and they're very user-friendly. Um, and so uh, one of the things that happened when um, I met Gordon was, yeah, I saw you had United Healthcare Student Insurance, but I wasn't really sure what the requirements were for getting um, the medications. Remember that most insurance companies consider antiretrovirals as specialty meds. And so you often have to go through a specialty pharmacy to get your specialty meds. Um, but you're not always sure if they really do or don't and if that particular policy requires that. So United Healthcare always uses OptumRx for their specialty meds, it appears. And so um, that was easy. And then um, what we did was you just faxed over um, the uh, copay assistance information. And so that's how the copays get met. So there are several steps that you have to take. It can be kind of labor intensive, but you know, in the end, maybe you're helping somebody stay healthy. And I love it that this insurance now for for kids up to 26 kids. You're not a kid, I know, but you are to me. Um, so remember that the highest risk is 13 to 24. So these are people that may not otherwise have had access to. Um, insurance, if they can stay on their parents' plan, maybe they will reach out. Some of those kids may not because they don't want their parents to know. Um, but there's a lot of ways to deal with this, a whole bunch of ways. Remember also that Medicaid pays for PrEP. You do have to fill out an HIV diagnosis verification form indicating that you've done the appropriate lab testing. You have to fax all of that stuff up to Medicaid or to whatever their specialty plan is um, with Medicaid, their uh, MMA plan or whatever. Um, but they won't cover PrEP. It's just steps, you know, and it's, it's extra work. But it's worth it when you have people that are motivated and they're asking for help to be able to give them the help that they're asking for, which I think is, is you know, the goal for all of us. All right. Any questions, concerns? Anybody want to talk about that financial piece? Oh, Dr. Poirier again. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my question is concerning some of these HMO Medicaids. Is anybody monitoring their activity? Uh, it seems like they're offering, often throwing up roadblocks and doing anything to hinder care. I'm not going to mention any names, but some of them are united in the way that they affect how I provide health and care. Some of these, some of these unified HMOs are actually requiring pre-authorizations for CD4 counts and viral loads, which have to be done before or within two weeks of the appointment. Otherwise, they're going to bill the client for it. 
To be honest with you, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to be doing prior authorizations for CD4 counts and viral loads. Uh, that's absolutely ridiculous. Another thing that I have them do is they'll send me a list of preferred medicines. You know, why is somebody, why do you have somebody on Complera? Well, first of all, they've been out for five years and doing well with it. And they'll have a list of generics. Why can't they be on these? And, and, and they expect the response back. I don't. They go right into the shredder. I don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any time to deal with that. But is there someone in Tallahassee or with any other organization that's actually monitoring some of these things, these activities? <laughs> okay. We don't have an answer for that question. Oh, Gay does. Okay. <laughs> Our panel is blank. Uh, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, um, they are the ones who are monitoring this and any issues, problems, complaints um, that you have, I would give in writing to them. Uh, that is their job. So it's the Agency for Healthcare Administration is where all of that is going to go. Right. So go to the website and there's electronically you can submit that. So what you want me to do is approach the agency <laughs> who Fifteen years. <laughs> Here's what I got to say. This is an agency you want me to consult because this is an agency for the last 15 years who has been sending client information to my home fax number, and when I call them and tell them over and over again they're sending it to the wrong place, they tell me they don't have the ability to send it to where it needs to go. So I hear the frustration, and we all feel it. And some days it's good. Some days we're all in those peaks and valleys. He's in a valley right now. Um, <laughs> you know, you get, you get pushed to the point of why are you doing it? Remember, we're doing it because we want people to be healthy. We want people to have the best benefit, but we have problems. And if it takes us all writing letters saying, please, you're just throwing up barriers to us doing what we need to do to take care of patients. If you're a patient, write to ACA, write to whoever. You know, I to Obama, I don't know. But, you know, these are things that there's only so many hours in the day. We only have so much staff. It's extremely labor intensive every day to show up and see five times I need to call this insurance company to tell them there's not a significant drug interaction. This patient's, you know, so there's a lot of issues. It's not going to get solved today. And the increase in the bureaucracy is increasing like exponentially, um, but it's because we're trying to control costs. And we have to decide where should the cost come from? You know, should it really be providers not being able to take care of patients because all they're doing is being tied to the phone and the fax machine or having the entire office staff trying to help get all the stuff done? It's ex extremely labor intensive. Yes, maybe it's 20 minutes, but it's 20 minutes per patient. So this is a lot of money that's being spent on these things. And it is something to talk about. I'm really glad you brought it up. That's good. Yes, ma'am. I am Christina Rivers. I actually work for the Agency for Healthcare Administration. I, and I'm a contract manager for one of the HIV AIDS specialty health care plans, managed care plans. And the complaint hub, it has been revamped. And we take those seriously. I have three meetings a week. And we bring up complaints and they have to be addressed and resolved in some manner. So you as a provider, you can submit the complaint through that hub. The member or the enrollee can submit and the um, if there's a payee that's speaking on behalf of the recipient, they can submit. So it is open and it's very um, specific in terms of what your issue is. If it's a claims or reimbursement issue or access to care, submit it, and it, those do get looked at, and they, they are monitored for those very reasons. Okay. I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you. Hi. Apart from ACA, I think one of the next perhaps best things you can do is to work through some of the established uh, legisl uh, advocacy and lobbying organizations. I don't know what your, your time commitment is. Uh, is everyone familiar with the Florida HIV AIDS um, Advocacy Network? Yes. Uh, they have been very aggressive. Uh, when, when responding, when they have found out about uh, 
uh, roadblocks that some of the uh, Affordable Care Act, for example, insurance plans have been putting up with respect to certain HIV med medications. They've been very aggressive in, in um, shining a light on uh, that inequity and, and trying to get something done about it. So the next best thing I think you can do is to work through an organization like FDAN. And they're managed through, uh, they're administered through the Florida's uh, AIDS Institute down in Tampa. Great. Well, I love it. We're actually having a conversation. This is great. And we're learning things um, that might impact on our ability to take care of more patients because we're going to get more patients based on the epidemiology. We have to have things simplified and streamlined in some way. Maybe we'll be people that make a difference in that. Does anybody else have... Oh, Gay has a comment. So if um, any of you on the panel could address um, drug resistance in relation to PrEP. Uh, the question came in from the panel, someone who is on PrEP, and are there concerns about developing drug resistance? And if you could just address that, please. Does anybody? Okay. Oh, you want to address it? Okay. You, you are probably a better person to address it. I can, I can speak to the couple studies, or the few studies that have been done that are most of the research. Um, the, the couple incidents where um, HIV and acute infection wasn't picked up, uh, my understanding was there was some issue with uh, uh, drug resistance, and that is part of the reason for really screening and making sure you're not missing uh, acute HIV um, when you're starting to move on PrEP, um, because there is the potential with uh, just a, a single um, or a combination drug like Truvada that you are not going to be treating effectively and developing some resistance patterns. Um, for those folks that were not found to be HIV um, positive, that didn't seem to cause any other long-term uh, uh, downstream effects. So as long as you're not um, prescribing PrEP to someone who um, does have that HIV infection, I think the, the risk is pretty minimal. And I don't know, Dr. Jones, you might elaborate further. Yeah. You know, when you're prescribing PrEP, you're supposed to be prescribing it to somebody that doesn't have HIV infection. That's right. So... You have to test, you have to have a conversation, you have to ask about any symptoms or signs that could be suggestive of acute HIV infection every single time, every three months. That's your commitment to the patient, and the patient needs to, you know, be prepared for those kind of questions. You set the stage for that in the first visit. Um, one of the nice things that I think um, Gilead did on their website is they made a patient-provider agreement um, the CDC, I think, has one also in their guidelines as well. You know, really take that kind of seriously. That first visit is the time to establish what's going to happen. What's the patient's responsibility? What's the provider's responsibility? And you have a conversation about that. Never forget you don't do those refills until you see that negative uh, HIV antibody test. So that's a critical part of it. Definitely things happen. Um, patients can skip doses during their time and potentially become HIV infected. So be very vigilant. Remind uh, every single time. Safer sex practices still should be uh, adhered to as much as possible with condoms. I know a lot of people don't like using condoms. Um, but PrEP is really part of a comprehensive prevention plan. And, you know, the studies on PrEP suggest that Having those conversations every three months, having the door open to uh, dialogue about prevention practices, patients actually sometimes decrease their risk-taking behavior. They may use condoms more often or reduce the number of, of unprotected acts uh, at different times. And so these are really important things to think about. Yes, there's always a risk that somebody will become infected. And if they do become infected, Truvada is not a complete regimen. It is very, um, you know, there's only so many, you know, it just takes one mutation for each drug to develop resistance, so that's possible. So we have to remember that. We have to remind our patients, hey, nothing is 100%. Um, even in patients that, you know, took it every single day, it was only 99%. So we have to remember that the risk is there, but there's also a good chance that if they take it properly, they won't get HIV and you won't have to worry about the resistance issue. This is a very important topic called PrEP. Um, and we 
young population. And if you look to social media, I think you'll see there's a lot of discussion um, amongst folks that are on PrEP or folks that are considering PrEP or folks that aren't wanting to take PrEP or have concerns about um, even PrEP being out there um, amongst um, the lay population in the college community for fear that um, there won't be compliance. So um, we're in a little bit of an unusual situation. I think we have a little bit of a bias sample on the side of campus that I work in. As I mentioned, we take care of the health sciences students. Um, not to say that the other students, the liberal arts students, aren't as <laughs> compliant. Um, but um, we, I think we have a little bit of an advantage. They come in very frequently with significant amounts of material, having done a significant amount of research, um, and have perhaps a little bit better understanding from a physiologic standpoint, pharmacokinetic standpoint, that um, how these medications work, and perhaps the bias sample is that we may have better compliance. This is a study I'd love to be able to do, um, and extremely important to, to Dr. Janelle's point, the education, especially as nurses and other healthcare providers, <coughs> physicians, a teachable moment can never ever be missed with these students. Um, to reinforce, reinforce, reinforce and to have a trusting, caring relationship with our patients. And I think, I have to brag a little bit, and Diane will concur, that I think we do a really good job of that at Student Health. We have a very close relationship with our patients because we're afforded that opportunity by virtue of time and the number of providers. And it's a very unique setting. We see these folks very closely for four and sometimes longer. We hope they stay on and do their graduate work with us and then stay and become employees. Um, but these um, relationships that we develop, the trusting relationships we develop are significantly important in terms of being able to transmit this information and having an open conversation with people and being open to that conversation is critical. Um, letting these students know that we're willing to discuss this, um, no judgment zones, um, I think makes a big difference in terms of compliance. We have a lot of people that want to talk. So the current protocol, as I understand it, states that once you start an individual on PrEP, they need to retest for HIV every three months. Three months. Is that accurate? And I would like to believe that that provides a golden opportunity. Uh, and this builds on what you just said about forming a quality relationship between provider and patient. Uh, the state of Florida has one of the largest publicly funded HIV testing programs in the nation. I don't know whether you all knew that. In fact, we may have the largest. We test well over 400,000 individuals uh, a year. Uh, we've got a few years where we've approached a half a million annually. Where we're trying to improve that is we test an awful lot of the worried well. Uh, we, and conversely, we've had challenges with um, getting individuals who are at high risk for HIV infection to test regularly. And we are seeing some progress with that. We're seeing our overall numbers go down in terms of annual tests, but we're, importantly, we're seeing our positivity rate go up because we, wanna, we want to be testing folks who are at risk for HIV. We wanna find those individuals who are at risk for HIV and then do all the next steps that are required to get them there. But back to your point, um, because it has been challenging for high-risk individuals to test regularly, if we can get a good partnership formed between patient and provider, that just folds testing as, a, as part of a, a, a next step behavior that the individual needs to engage in to make sure that they're uh, continuing to test negative for HIV. Uh, just to sort of reemphasize what has been kind of already stated, the importance of that open and honest conversation between patient and provider, I think, can't be understated. From, from my own experience, I think about two or three years ago, when I was having a conversation with um, a primary care provider, a general practitioner, there, well, they were very uncomfortable when they found out that I was gay and that I was uh, engaged, a man having sex with other men. Well, not just, not a, upset but just didn't quite know how to handle that and then the only follow-up question was well you're using condoms right and for me at that time I was mostly using condoms but there were some instances where I had you know not 100% use and you know that kind of position and for me was very difficult and so I said well, well yeah mostly and then we just kind of moved on um, 
So, and then, but of course, I, I, I cannot draw like a stronger contrast between that and my conversation with Dr. Junell, where I have Dr. Junell asking me with a beaming smile if I've ever used IV drugs. So, <laughs> so, uh, so to have that kind of non-judgmental conversation and that kind of open relationship is necessary because I know m many gay men are afraid to admit that they aren't 100% consistent with their safe sex practices. People don't want to admit that to themselves, and they don't want to admit it to their partners. And then people are not getting tested because they have that fear, and that sort of is perpetuating, I think, that so many new infections are happening between two people who think they're negative because they've been mostly consistent, and they don't have the providers, and they don't even have those conversations with their peers where they can honestly say, hey, you know, I slipped up, I didn't use a condom, you know, maybe I'm not 100%, you know, consistent with this, maybe I won't be 100% consistent in the future, what are the steps that I should take? Am I at risk? And knowing myself, you know, and knowing that I'm mostly consistent, but I have had slip ups in the past, and being willing to admit that to myself was a huge step. Um, but you know, it also, I went through student health at um, the liberal arts, through liberal arts and sciences, and then and I found, a, and actually, I think it was the first time I had asked, because I went specifically to ask about PrEP, and it was the first time I had asked that, the ARMP there. And um, I think also because of that, that's sort of catalyzed, there's gonna be a training with um, all the providers at Student Health, at um, the SRFC, right? What's SHCC. SHCC, yeah, yeah. yes, the student told us mixed up. Uh, at SHCC, uh, where they'll all be um, educated in the protocol. Just make one other comment. Um, the uh, experience that uh, many uh, folks that identify as gay or transgender, their experience really, as you walk through the door, um, is really, I think, colored. Um, and so your intake forms, for those providers out there, folks that are, have control over that, having boxes that people can identify their gender identity and how they, you know, their birth sex, um, makes a huge difference in terms of their ability to kind of relate and feel comfortable opening up um, about um, their sexual practices and they can really start deciding what, what they're gonna tell their provider from, from the get-go. And I think um, as a medical community, community, we can do a lot better with that and making um, our signs not always heterosexual uh, signs and kind of this uh, gender normative approach. So I think there's a lot uh, we need to be doing, um, you know, all those providers listening out there, I think we can be doing in our clinics to make that um, better. Um, I will say working with students and kind of, uh, kind of a younger generation than myself, um, and I work with them a lot on sexual history, and they seem to be much more on top of this conversation and better. So if there's a light at the end of the tunnel, I think there is a pop hopefully a group of students coming down that are just much more capable of understanding that if you're a man, you might not only have sex with a woman, and, uh, and understanding behavior versus sexual identity, and people get tripped up on all the time. So. Um, I think this is a great conversation. You know, I really like the thought of remembering that every single step of a patient's experience in your clinic matters. So even you guys that aren't frontline providers, if you're the registration clerk, you make everybody feel welcome because the minute you don't, the minute patients feel uncomfortable, and it may be not even anything you intend, but if you aren't welcoming, if you don't make people feel like they're in a place where they're gonna be respected and get what they need and be able to say what they need to say, front door to back door, they won't come back. And so we're gonna miss this great opportunity for people that have finally gotten the courage to come in to get tested or maybe come in to get linked to care for the first time. The minute we make that hard or uncomfortable, they're not coming back. So we gotta remember every single person Everywhere in that whole clinical experience matters. And you may think you don't, but you do. Yes, ma'am. Hello. My name is Sabrina Phillips, and I'm with Meridian Behavioral Healthcare Incorporated. I'm an HIV educator counselor and specialty coordinator. And I think pretty much, uh, Dr. Shah, you had answered a question, and then Lord, you touched on some more. My concern was when people come in to, um, to sign up to or get counsel about PrEP, you have to be HIV negative. And my, my question was, um, 
I know that there's a window period. Say that they come in and they test for the first time, and then that was negative. Naturally, you need to come back and test again within a certain period of time. Is there a way that that, that is monitored to make sure that they are definitely negative? So I think you answered something in, in the sense saying that having people to test regularly, is that, is, yeah, did you pretty much answer what I'm saying now? I think it speaks to the need to, get, unless you're using the most modern, most sensitive testing assays that we have available, okay. you know, I think, a gold standard would probably be, in addition to doing a Western blot, doing a PCR, right? To check for uh, if you were worried about a HIV we, infection. We don't do Western yeah. blots. Um, we're doing the, the fourth generation. The fourth generation. Uh, if you're doing a third gen, you do have to do the Western blot, but the third generation won't pick up acute. Right. So you have to do a viral load. But either one, if you think somebody's acutely infected, a viral load. Yeah, Florida now uses uh, the, the fourth gen technology, it's blood based uh, technology. It closes the window period to around 17 days. And then, of course, running a PCR to check for uh, acute infection is probably not, you know, if, if the funding's available to do that. Uh, but aside from that, continuing to test regularly for HIV is probably the next best thing that you can do. Yeah, to, um, so I know when I came to Dr. Janelle, she had asked me about the window period for my recent activity, if I'd ever had uh, any, or if I'd had any recent risky sexual encounters or other types of risky behavior. And we use that the 17 day um, window period, which is what the current, as you said, fourth generation tests test for. But I also know that speaking to some of my peers who have gone to other doctors, that they assume that there is a three month window period and that there are, that the tests only te can be, and they basically, I, I know one individual was asked to basically, you need to be celibate for three months and then come back and then we'll talk about PrEP. And guess what? He never went on PrEP. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, having everyone informed about the, and up to date about these tests and that, you know, a lot of people still they have this three month number in their minds. Um, that, but the most, the, the up to date, the state of the science is that 17 days is accurate. and. Um, yeah, so I just want to make that point. <laughs> the other piece I would say is in kind of some of the guidelines out there, they recommend certainly having a conversation about any signs or symptoms concerning in the last, you know, uh, few uh, month or uh, that would be concerning for an acute HIV infection, so flu-like illness, um, and then of course having an informed conversation about you know what what risk um, did you uh, have over the last um, uh, last couple of weeks, a little bit more than a couple. So remember that starting PrEP isn't an emergency. A decision can be made. So if somebody comes in and you think, um, geez, I don't know, I think this person may be at risk for actually having HIV. They've got, you know, fevers and I thought I felt a lymph node and they haven't, you know, you're worried about it. You think maybe they have acute HIV infection. Don't start PrEP that day. Order an HIV-1, 2, fourth generation antigen antibody assay, and then get it at the same time, order an HIV viral load, and wait for both of those results before the decision is made. Don't push the patient off saying, let's wait, you know, three months, but say, hey, you know what? I want to put you on PrEP. I want this to be successful for you, but the worst thing that I could do for you is to put you on PrEP today when you could be HIV infected and then we could get into big problems because honestly, Truvada is a great drug. It's great also for people that are positive. And we use that as a foundation for so many of our regimens. The minute you get a K65R to Truvada or an M184B um, to m tricitabine, you're done. You know, you're not going to be able to rely on those drugs and it's going to really eliminate options for treatment if they do become HIV infected. It's a big hot mess. We want to avoid that. Always worry about acute infection. That antigen antibody assay, that fourth generation test is good. It's not perfect. If you're worried about it, get the viral load and say, hey, this will come back in about a week. We're going to set you back up. I don't want you to lose touch with me. Please come back. Let me have your phone number. Give me a good one. Let me test it right now before you leave this room so that I know how to find you. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, you know, think about it. Don't take any risk for the patient. The first thing is do no harm. 
And that's what we are going to try and do. Yes, ma'am. My name is Carolyn Leitner, but I'm, I, I just want to ask a question from concerned mom, okay, because I have teenagers and young adults. And I do talk to them about um, safe sex and all that. And, you know, I hike into their accounts to see what's going on. <laughs> but, um, and the prevailing thing is, oh, I'm not worried about that. I'm just going to take a pill. So what are we re really saying to them? You oh. know, um, mm -hmm. and I know you're stressed talking about safe sex and all that. And, you know, I push abstinence. But, um, but that's, just, that's a big misconception because, oh, I'm just going to take a pill. I'm not worrying about any of that other stuff. You hear that complacency? Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> we and can't so let that I'm happen. Just <laughs> concerned. I'm just, I'm, you know, it's just really a big concern. Okay. Anybody on the panel want to address that? Um, this actually came up by uh, one of my patients that I prescribed prep in a serious sporting couple. So his partner is HIV positive. And actually the positive partner came in and said, I'm against, you know, I'm against prep. Um, I think it's making you know people have sex without you know without condoms not thinking about it. So I think you're not alone in, in worrying about that. Um, uh, as Dr. Janelle pointed out in the studies when this was done, um, actually the incidence of kind of uh, kind of there were lower rates of high risk sexual behavior. So we actually um, and, and the thought is that with every three months having counseling and discussion um, and trying to dispel the myth that. This is just the only thing you need um, as a big part of this is this doesn't protect against any other sexually transmitted infection. Um, so having that conversation every three months, at least in the study, which doesn't necessarily always pan out to be the real world. Um, and so we have to, I think, um, consider that. And I, you know, like I said, I've had a patient bring that up. So I think having advocates out there and as part of some of these community groups, having this discussion and making sure people are aware that this isn't protecting against other forms of sexually transmitted infection, and is just one one way in which we're going to keep people safe. And in these studies, those folks were also using condoms. I mean, this was not just prep. We haven't studied just prep and no other um, form of uh, control. And those, at least in those studies, those patients did report um, uh, good, you know, condom use. Um, so, um, so that's a part of uh, kind of protection. I, I want to uh, just ask to clarify the, the question. Do you mean that you you hear people saying that they are not worried about contracting an STI because they think they can just take a pill to cure it, or do you think? Yeah, I'm sure they're they're just okay. they're just not even um, want to have the conversation because I'm going to be like Magic Johnson, oh, and so they okay. they never see at yeah. all what we saw in the '80s when we were you know okay. young adults and teens. So that's okay. that's that's what we get because I talk you know to my my uh, kids, friends, and everything. Right, so, so to just repeat that, you, many of your kids, or your kids and your kids' peers, yes. are saying that if they were to contract HIV or to contract some other STI, that they're not worried because they see people living with it today and they're living yes. healthy lives, and so why should I be worried? If I get it, I'll be fine. Yes. Right, and that is a, a huge concern, and you know, that's, I think, again, one of the things we need to continue pushing in these dialogues that, you know, a life taking, you know, antiretrovirals is not. It's, it still is a life with um, huge inconveniences and with huge health challenges, and that is something that you have to then be consistent with. And it's it's and on, on top of that, there is huge stigma attached. And while I think we should be doing our part to fight that stigma and help uh, incorporate HIV positive people into the community so they don't feel alienated and isolated, but at the same time, there's enough reason to be. Um, to, to kind of be pushing that away. And, and, and I've heard that as well, you know, among my peers that, you know, people are, some people just think, well, you know, we can cure it, why not? Or we can manage it. Well, he's still got the mic. Uh, one of the issues is, is yeah, also in the way of getting, <laughs> he can, he'll, he'll be a very simple one. <laughs> I mean, even within the gay community, there's bareback parties with young people. Right, so do I, you want me to? It's in line with that other okay. question. Maybe not, a lot of people don't know what those are. Right, so that's a very interesting point. You, you raise a question that you know there is a subculture within the gay community where people choose actively to bear back, and which is to have sex without a condom. And even beyond that, there's, well, I actually read a really interesting article not long ago about, um, it's called Breeding Culture, and it was about 
the idea that there are people that it's a, this is a small but relevant subset of the gay community where people think that they're going to get HIV anyway, they want to have sex without condoms, and then they say that, and then some of them, they, be, they label themselves, quote, bug chasers, where they then just actively pursue contracting HIV so that they can get it over with. You know, and this is incredibly worrisome, and it kind of opens up a lot of really interesting questions about the psychology of that. And you know, I don't know the answers to that. I know that there are definitely people who just openly engage in bareback sex without any question. And they think that, you know, that they just want to have fun. And I think a lot of these people are also coming from a place of like psychological hurt. There are people who are struggling with far more issues. I mean, a lot of gay men struggle with issues of acceptance in their community and with their families. And I think a lot of that very risky behavior, extremely high risk behavior, stems from uh, those deeper set issues. Jennifer, so we are at our time, but if everybody is okay, we don't come back for our next presentation because we're going into lunch. Is it okay if we go over a few more? I have two questions here, and I have one more question from the web. If the panel and the group, and I don't know what everybody wants to do. If you guys are okay with that, can we go for a yeah, couple more questions? Yeah, and if anybody wants to go on to lunch, you're welcome. Don't feel obligated to okay. stay, but we're having this great conversation, so I don't know why. You okay, <laughs> so um, Katie has actually been waiting um, patiently, so I, I'm gonna let her an answer next, okay. her, ask her a question. Okay, so we've been talking an awful lot about, which one am I using? Oh. Um, PrEP, so why don't we talk about PEP for a second? So with pre-test and post-test counseling, it's kind of up to the discretion of the provider. Of, of course, you have to remind about the window period. So my question is, healthcare workers have such an easy PEP experience, well, easy per se, you're still scared, but you can immediately tell a supervisor and within 72 hours, the quicker you take it, the better, of course. But my question is, we're focusing so much on PrEP, we need to include this in our post-test counseling and pre-test counseling that if someone in the general public, you know, with these apps, people are like, yeah, are you clean? You know, you're drunk, you're, the lights go down, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next day, they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I have to disclose my status. I know it was wrong. It's the law and this. So how does that person know about PEP? Man, I can get on a pill that greatly reduces my risk of this transmission that just happened yesterday. But my doctor and my nurses are telling me, um, you have to come back in 30 days, 30 to 90 days, there's a 90 day window period to get tested. So my question is, how can we incorporate teaching the residents, the county residents, how they can possibly get a hold of PEP within 72 hours of an HIV risk that they might not even know that they came in contact with until that person said so? Martha, you wanna address this one? We have actually had um, residents go to the emergency room after condoms break or they have decided, oops, I made a mistake, I wasn't protecting myself. And ERs have been prescribing PEP. The issue is they write those prescriptions and don't even talk about how the patient is going to get the medication. Um, so that education with the, the residents or the fellows in the ER about the PAN network or patient assistance programs is critical because we had, a, we had someone come in a couple of weeks ago who had gone to the emergency room because the condom had broke. They had written he, these prescriptions. He didn't know how to pay for them. He came to the health department a week later and that's outside the 72 hour window, so the prescriptions were basically useless. But if he had come right after he had gotten those prescriptions, we could have hooked him up with patient assistance programs and helped him get those drugs in the 72 hour time period so that he could have protected himself. I can only speak from a student health perspective, but we've worked very closely, as a matter of fact, our amazing pharmacy through the Student Health Center um, now carries the meds, um, and we have very ready access, and we have on-call providers 24-7, and <coughs> students um, are able to access care 24-7. We've worked closely, specifically starting with the needle stick hotline, which I also run, uh, for the employees, but I work directly with Dr. Payton, who's amazing, um, that runs the ED. 
in terms of um, getting uh, pharmacy to get the initial medication and then the students immediately know to call us. Um, and we have very ready access. Now I know this has been a significant issue in the community um, in terms of accessing these medications and the local pharmacies are now only carrying the 30 day supplies. Um, they will not break the packages anymore. So providers were writing, a lot of providers were writing the seven days or the 28 days, which is the protocol or the seven days because we wanted to see them back because we wanted to check their labs or see how they were doing and they weren't able to get the prescriptions filled. So we've worked with um, the community and with the ED and we're doing more work. We're not perfect, I will say, but I think we're much better and we welcome any feedback from the community um, in terms of the college population. If there's anything more we can be doing, um, please contact me directly. Let's let Dr. Ryan know. Uh, Florida's plan with respect to MPEP, uh, I mentioned the strategic plan earlier, it's, it's for both PrEP and MPEP. And I'm, I'm not the lead on the MPEP portion, I can tell you, I think there's a few copies of the MPEP toolkit available. <laughs> For MPEP. Yes. Right. Uh, it's, it's nearly finished. Um, uh, Florida, we're choosing to focus initially for MPEP supports uh, on working with emergency room doctors, uh, family planning clinics, most importantly, rape uh, crisis centers, and working specifically with uh, SANE nurses, sexual abuse nurse examiners, sexual assault, uh, to try to get. Uh, some MPEP related resources and, and mainly uh, resources to access the patient assistance program. Uh, as you probably all know, there's a variety of combinations of ARAs that can be used uh, for MPEP treatment. Uh, I've heard that some of the manufacturers are easier to work with than others, uh, but there is assistance out there. A little bit different from our trip, but I'm with pediatric infectious diseases and <clears throat> the American Academy of Pediatrics in the last couple of years has recommended that all young adults between the ages of 18 and 21 have HIV screening done as a routine part of their health care without question as to the risk. And so that's being presented in primary care offices as this is just part of your routine health care. Everybody needs to get HIV screened. So hopefully over time, as these young children grow up into adulthood, they'll realize getting HIV screen is just part of what we do and not associated with any sort of stigma. Yeah. Could you guys hear that in the back? Okay, Dr. Ryan is a pediatrician who says that they're now incorporating HIV testing for 18 to, to 21. The American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended in line with a lot of other um, recommendations Incorporate that as part of your routine screening. I know all of you guys are well aware that the testing uh, statutes in the state of Florida were updated in July of this year. If you're testing outside of the DOH, where you still have to do pre and post testing and all that jazz, in regular healthcare settings, you can inform a patient that they're going to be tested for HIV, that if they do test positive, that their reports with identifiers are going to be sent to the uh, county health department in which they live. Do they consent to that testing? Yes or no, you just document it in the chart. You don't have to have them sign an informed consent. You don't have to do post-test counseling. Um, you know, all of the prior things that many people consider barriers to testing have been improved. And so just telling somebody, hey, you know what, everybody comes through my door, I test. Not necessarily because I think that you might have sex with multiple partners, but who knows what your partner's doing. We can only know where we are and what we're doing, and you don't ever know what somebody else is really doing unless you're with them like attached to the hip, um, and that doesn't happen. This is not that kind of world. So I, I think anybody that hits your door, offer it, offer that HIV test, even if they're not there um, specifically for an HIV test. Hi. So, um, Dr. Janelle, I think you mentioned that the most effective, uh, the mo one of the most effective audiences was from ages 13 to 24 years of age. So, um, I just wanted to ask, how would we address those individuals that are still minors in school that are not getting proper, like that aren't getting comprehensive 
on safe sex education. How would we educate those individuals to make sure that they have the resources that they need to get, let's say, PrEP or maybe safe sex practices? Because if there are such varying degrees within schools, how would we address that issue? I think that's a fantastic question. Certainly the environment is a different one than it has been in the past in terms of the ability to provide really effective um, sexual education um, in our schools. It's just a different environment. I don't know, Gay, if you have any. Um, oh, okay. Sure, so just um, my former roommate when I lived in Orlando worked with Planned Parenthood as a um, safe sex educator. And I know that Planned Parenthood has a great program in, in his case, you know, he would go to high schools and educate um, uh, high school classrooms about sexual education. But of course, there had to be a contract between those individual high schools or that county and Planned Parenthood. And in that case, that was an incredible, an incredibly uh, informative um, resource that, that, that they were offering. But I also know that that is not everywhere. Uh, for instance, when I, the only sexual health education, sex education I ever received was in middle school, and it amounted to signing an abstinence pledge to abstain for my future life. So <laughs> it was not exactly um, receiving, I wasn't receiving any information that was relevant to me. And I didn't really receive that information until I sought it out online. And you know, I definitely think we should be doing a better job. And that begs the question of like higher sort of policy initiatives. Education in schools is really tricky because you have parents who want it, parents who don't want it. Um, I know here in Alachua County we do have um, a program that has been in the schools called PAUSE. It's um, Peers United for Advocacy and Sexual something, the PAUSE program. And they have peer educators in the schools who are available to talk to their peers about STIs, about where to get tested, about how to keep themselves safe. That, you know, peers to peers is the best education um, as long as you have a peer who has the proper knowledge. Um, you don't want someone spreading false information. So I think we have to train our, our kids to be peers to provide that information. <clears throat> kids are gonna listen to other kids. They're not necessarily gonna listen to their parents. Um, and I think that's where we need to start is educating our kids to educate other kids. And I have one <coughs> final last question um, from the web and I'm not sure if you have enough information to um, give an answer here. This person says, should an HIV negative woman stay on antiretroviral therapy for the duration of her pregnancy if her partner is an HIV positive male? Oh, I think that's a great question. And I'm assuming the antiretroviral therapy is PrEP, not a complete regimen because it's not positive. Um, so that's pretty interesting. If you look at the perinatal guidelines, I'm just gonna steal this one if that's okay. Um, <laughs> if you look at the perinatal guidelines, Yes, if they're not committed to having condom use throughout the entire pregnancy, um, the worst thing that could happen is for her to become HIV infected during pregnancy. You want to avoid that at all costs. And so if they're not committed to condom use or abstinence after she's <coughs> pregnant, then prep. And all the way through the pregnancy. There haven't been any studies to suggest that that is unsafe at this point. Um, so I think that that kind of makes sense. And we don't want to have her zero convert, you know, when she's 36 weeks pregnant and you're like, holy mackerel, because that's when they have the highest viral load and there is no way you're gonna get all, the whole planets to align so you can get her on therapy and suppressed in time. So yes, prep throughout pregnancy if you're in a zero discordant couple and you're not committed to abstinence and condom use with all sexual activity. Well, okay abstinence or economy of all sexual activity. All right, I think we're going to quit here, but thank you guys so much. And thank you guys. That was wonderful.